Hello, my name is Luis Pirit Santo, and this is the second episode of our podcast, Deep Learning Sessions Portugal. We are a group of enthusiasts that volunteer to organize events and create content around AI in Portugal. This is our second episode. We present this time the recording of our opening session of 2024 that took place on the 25th of January this year at the headquarters of Vieira de Almeida, Sociedade de Advogados, in Lisbon. Once again, we hosted a roundtable to summarize the hot topics in deep learning from last year and the predictions for this new year. This session is available to you as a podcast, so you can get up to date on this topic from everywhere, whenever you like. This year, we have brand new initiatives to help us better achieve our missions of improving AI literacy in Portugal, sharing machine learning development made in Portugal, and gathering a community of people interested in deep learning. Among these other initiatives, you can find our new podcast, Deep Digest, a casual conversation in Portuguese about deep learning topics and also Deep Learning 101 that serves as an entry point for people that wonder how deep learning can help them in their main point of interest, that being speech, sports or even visual arts. Check our website at deeplearning.pt for the description of all our initiatives. This time, I was a host at this roundtable, and I had the pleasure of inquiring five tech experts. Francisco Santos from Fundação para Ciência e Tecnologia, Paul Dimas from the Center for Responsible AI, Crisa Zerva from Instituto Superior Técnico, Catarina Silva from Center for Informatics and Systems of the University of Coimbra, and Jacovina Quindelidi from Vieira de Almeida, Sociedade de Advogados. This was such an insightful session, and we are very happy to finally share it with you. We we'll leave you to our recording of our table on Deep Learning is Alive, trends from 2023 to 2024. to explore a bit what happened in AI last year, which was a really busy year. We do this every year and we want also to learn a bit what you think will be happening this year, which is a really hard question. So my first question will be, well, I would ask you to present a bit yourselves and for you to say what was the most impactful thing in AI that you remember from last year. I would ask you, Francisco, for you to, to start. Yes, you, you may use this. So first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So my name is Francisco Santos. I'm a, I'm a professor and a researcher at IST, at the Computer Science Department. Um, my background is in PhD in AI, and uh, previously I tried to be a physicist, and I changed my mind, and I moved to computer science because I was thinking that this, this century will be more interesting on this side. But then, uh, so at this point, I'm also uh, a vice president of FCT, and that's uh, probably the rule <laughs> why you invited me here today. So, um, so last year, so last, last year. year, I would say that, so I will not speak about my area of research, but I will say that I think the, the most interesting or demanding part would be probably the discussions around the AI Act. I think, okay. I think that's, that's probably that's one of the things that um, actually change a bit the perception of AI, thinking about areas that are, that were spoken within, among experts, started to speak. It is spoken uh, broadly. Uh, of course, Paul will have <laughs> much to say about this, of course, but uh, I think that will be the, my, the main yeah. my top. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Paulo, please. Um, okay, so I'm uh, Paulo, uh, so I'm from Nbebel, so I'm the vice president, of, uh, vice president of product innovation at Nbebel. Uh, I've been at Nbebel for eight years. It has been like a roller coaster. So I started when we were just 12. Now we are in 350 people. And um, and yeah, we started with the uh, AI DNA. So uh, Nbebel was founded by um, two PhDs on, on natural language processing. So I've been following 
uh, AI for for you know ten years now at Enbevel and myself uh, eight years. Um, so Enbevel uh, last year or in the end of 2022 uh, started also a big initiative on on AI that is uh, the Center for Responsible AI, and um, that is maybe. And I'm going to quote Pedro Bizarro from Fidzai, the biggest uh, consortium on responsible AI in the world. So it's not me. <laughs> and Pedro <laughs> is an authority on responsible <laughs> AI. So he knows that. Um, and so that is a consortium that joins um, uh, research centers, uh, seven research centers with 10 AI startups and, and five industry leading companies. So we have here represented, this is Good because they are the, because all of us are part of the, the <laughs> center. So, so it's like, a, 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 no. Uh, but yeah, so, um, uh, what, what are we doing on, on the center? So we are developing, uh, products, uh, products that are based on responsible AI that have an impact on people's lives. But we are doing that by joining, uh, the research centers, the startups and the industry leading companies that bring the, the real world problems. Um, so I can talk more about that afterwards. <laughs> uh, so, but regarding last year, so what, what, what were the, the, the major breakthroughs like last year? So I think that the major one, um, uh, for me, uh, so like more like in chronological order was uh, GPT-4 that, uh, was launched, I think around March or something. Uh, it's still the, the, the top uh, performing uh, language model, which is kind of something unique for a company like OpenAI uh, that <laughs> had 200 people at the time, I think. Uh, and so GPT-4 was really a, a major breakthrough. Of course, it's like a closed model, which uh, is something that is simply not acceptable, I would say, uh, for a company that is called OpenAI. So <laughs> it's a closed, <laughs> it's a closed, uh, should be closed AI. We should rename that. So, but, but still, I think that was a major, major breakthrough. Um, then, uh, I agree with Francisco. So we had, um, the AI Act that, uh, included, uh, for the first time, the, the reference to foundation models. So I think that was, um, something very in, in important. And then started the discussion that Jakovina, uh, for sure is gonna <laughs> talk about. <laughs> and, uh, and then I think that was the, 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 the two major, uh, achievements, uh, I would say. Uh, then more recently we had the, the GPT 4V, which was really also amazing. It's also a bit surprising to see Google, you know, not being able to catch up uh, on, mm -hmm. on OpenAI, which has been like a, a story by, by itself. Uh, we had also the OpenAI saga with some Altman that shows, you know, uh, where the power in the world is. Uh, and, um, and yeah, but then there are lots of, uh, and, and then of course, yeah, open source. I think open source is something that we're going to okay. talk a lot. I think uh, open source models are really something that is really, uh, it's, it's really strategic for Europe and so on, but yeah. So okay. okay. Thank you very much, Krisa. Yes. Thanks. So thank you very much for inviting me. I'm Krisa Zelva. I'm an assistant professor in IST and also part of the Center for Responsible AI. And I'm focusing more on natural language processing, so language models, um, and more specifically on aspects of uh, interpreting their decisions. So uncertainty, confidence of the models, bias, fairness, all the related issues to the center of responsible AI um, with uh, a lot of focus on uncertainty and confidence. Um, so if I then need to think of my trends, <laughs> I will be, there will be some observer bias here, but it's hard to move away from language models. Uh, but for me, what was apart from GPT-4 and all the very quickly released open access models that was really useful and impressive is also all the attempts and the research directions towards adapting them to other domains, other tasks. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of work that allowed us to actually use them for different tasks, a lot of work on multimodal um, AI, so merging language models with other modalities as image GPT-4 already has, GPT-5 probably will have more modalities. Um, so this was very impressive. And of course, again, being a bit biased, um, it invited a lot of more work on interpreting models. So if we have these large models that we sometimes don't know much about because they're not always open, 
how can we interpret their decisions, how can we estimate how confident they are about their decisions. So that is a very exciting direction of work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Katerina. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much uh, uh, for the invitation. It's lovely to be here. Uh, so my name is Katerina Silva. I'm a professor at the University of Coimbra. And my research on the CISUP, that's our research center, I would say it's on two things. It's on big data and small data. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really interested in, in explainability of models that are built with uh, a lot of uh, data, like large language models, but not only. And uh, another part of my research is on what I would call small data, and uh, exploring few short learning um, approaches that uh, are two separate worlds, but they exist. You have a lot of data to some problems, and you have very low data to uh, other problems. So I would say that the two things I do very shortly. <coughs> yeah, <Kovina. laughs> so my name is Yekovina. <laughs> I'm a senior associate here at VDA in EDS theory of practice. I'm one of the people that work uh, for the DA for the consortium for the Center for Responsible AI. Um, so part of the, and I'm also doing my PhD, although it's behind because of the Center for Responsible AI, <laughs> um, on uh, AI and law in Nova School of Law, where I'm also teaching. Um, if we wanted to group a bit what was the, the big buzz, of course, for 2023, we will all agree that it was ChatGPT. Uh, to go on the part aside from the use because I'm still I'm still fascinated and I still react mm -hmm. like it's the first time that I'm seeing it doing something so I'm still excited is to see how the perception of, uh, of of the world change when they talk about AI when they interact with AI systems we had before we didn't have something like this but now it became a thing that does not only involve around people that they are working in the field that they are approaching it in their own area of expertise. So I think the world changed in that way. Um, it would be impossible not to mention the AI Act, although I think it would be to also foresee on the end of the session what we'll be talking about in 2024 as well. But especially from May onwards uh, of last year, uh, there were so many developments in the area of, of AI, AI, AI and law, AI and policy and regulation, uh, and that also shows a bit of a trend uh, about the impact that AI, and mostly coming from generative AI, that it had in the society. I would say that yeah. that would be the two. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> please, Sorry, yes. <laughs> So, but I'm in line uh, here with this AI for society. My my catch word would be the democratization of AI. Okay. So now we have a lot of AI experts everywhere. Everyone <laughs> knows how it works and how to use it. Mm -hmm. And that I think was a game changer this year. Yeah. So yeah, we heard LLMs, uh, ChatGPT. We heard regulation. We heard uh, responsible AI. And my first question will be for Yakovina about the AI Act. So I would like to know a bit what happened during last year and why was it like such a big thing and how does it compare, for example, with other regulations around the world? And also, I would like to mention that you, uh, inside of Center for Responsible AI, you addressed the letter to, to change some things in the, in the AI Act. Was it successful? I would like to know everything that you can share with us. So. I have brought my cheat sheet as yes. well to know what we said. But yeah, I can say that it was successful. Overall, yeah. it seems to be. I'm still reading through uh, the act, but to go a bit uh, backwards and to see it from the, from the beginning. So in April 2021, the European Commission published the first proposal for AI regulation. So this started the first, let's say, discussion for regulating AI after 2016, when the European Parliament came and said, okay, we need rules on AI. So commissions started working on them. And they started from ethics because it was easier to approach and also to approximate the technology and what was going on. And that draft came on, uh, on April 2021. And of course, it had a, a huge backlash. Uh, many things didn't make sense. They were already obsolete by the time that they were published. And that was taken into consideration. So although everyone was very excited, we were looking at it and we were saying, ah, that doesn't make any sense. This is not going to stay like that and it will take forever for, for the regulation to pass. 
it didn't take forever. It actually took a lot of work from the side of, uh, of the European Commission and the Parliament and the specialty committees. It actually became faster than what we were expecting. And I think it happened faster to be now very close to it. And there were a lot of developments added. And I'll explain how, because of generative AI. That gave a bit the push uh, that it was needed. And this is what Paolo was mentioning about foundation models. So from April, we have the council talking about it at the end of the year, the parliament talking about it. And then in May, two days before another event of deep learning sessions, we have the leak of the text. And it's the first time that uh, foundation models were trying to be regulated. So generative AI, as it was picked up from that Stanford terminology, and we were all looking at it and saying, what, what is this? Nobody's using this. Not even engineers are using this. Only uh, Stanford people are using this. What do they mean? And they also scrapped out all the provisions that everybody was complaining about, that they were very obsolete so, and very broad. For example, in the original text, even um, an Excel sheet could have been covered by the regulation, which was crazy. Mm -hmm. And after that, we also saw a change in the way that um, the whole discussions were being discussed. So it became the biggest soap opera of European <laughs> regulation to this day, with very active participation from media, very active participation from the members of the parliament on Twitter on X, and uh, on LinkedIn, uh, and a lot of political push. Mm -hmm. So the Spanish presidency in the parliament wanted to be the one to close the deal. <laughs> they did it. And they did it by making a lot of things available to the public to create a bit that sense that, OK, we already have a regulation. At the same time, while we were already discussing during the summer, okay, probably by the end of the year we're going to have a regulation, um, in November uh, we had a very weird political move from Germany, France, and Italy, where they went and they signed a joint paper that some saw, some didn't, it didn't uh, become fully available, saying we have agreed how to regulate AI and specifically how to regulate generative AI because France has some interests uh, because of their own company that they want to be uh, a European competitor for open AI, and they didn't mm -hmm. want to pass some of the rules. Okay. From our side, uh, we had issued the, the open letter because we did identify some challenges, uh, mostly in relation to innovation, to open source models, as Paolo was mentioning, but also a lot of parts of lack of clarity, some things that they were a bit excessive that didn't make sense in terms of regulation, room to make it better. I'll go through the points afterwards, but to close the, the story mm -hmm. and the, the, the AI exactly. drama. Um, then uh, after this, everyone was expecting that the AI Act will fail. But the technical discussions kept on going on from October onwards, very intensive ones. And finally, it's time to close the deal. Mm -hmm. And they're entering a room, the, all the, the members of the Parliament Council and so on, in December, before the end of the presidency of Spain, and also before the Christmas holidays. Okay. And they practically agreed, we're not going to go out of this room until we close it. So they had two consecutive negotiations of 22 hours each. There were viral photos going around of piles of sneakers and energy drinks on the side uh, to sustain them. And finally, they did close a deal on the 8th uh, of December, almost midnight, going to the 9th of December. And after that, also, because we're not talking about it that much, but it's a fact, within one week, they also approved the product liability directive that covers liability of products that they, con that they contain AI as well. Okay. It's important also to consider. And then they started discussing about the technical terms. Let's fix it, let's wrap it up, let's fix the text, and it keeps on going on. So <laughs> this week, on Monday, <laughs> we had another leak of the final text that nobody had seen. We had seen parts of it, but uh, no, never fully. And it was published by a journalist that was not a very classic move. That journalist quitted afterwards <laughs> uh, from where he was working on, so that also says something. But it was also published, a consolidated version, by members of the parliament. So that is another political move. And how it seems to be playing out is because France keeps on pushing to delay or to change something for the generative <laughs> AI part. But right now, Germany is not supporting, and Italy is not supporting. And since this uh, leak is almost final, and they are discussing it with the premise of closing it on the 2nd of February and having the first AI regulation in the world, for better or for worse, by the end of February. Probably it's too big to fail right now. Yeah. So that is a bit the story. Now, going to our side, 
uh, we started discussing it uh, after June onwards, and we had several calls with uh, with Magda Koch from VDA and with Paolo and Elena Muniz, um, and then afterwards with Adrien Martins to see, okay, how we're going to approach it. We need to say something, and we had uh, ideas, and uh, and we discussed them a lot. There is a lot of Americanization in the conversation around regulation, and that mm -hmm. picks up on the other part of your question. And uh, we wanted to touch about mostly the topics related to innovation and real-world testing uh, of AI systems, including high-risk systems, to remove the restrictions, because okay. there was a restriction to not be able to test high-risk systems <coughs> on real-world condition. I want to say we managed, so we can put it on us uh, and give a pat in the back. Uh, for the, with the current draft, yes. appears that it covers that. The same goes for some exceptions for open source generative AI models. They won't need to comply with all the very <laughs> strict <laughs> rules. They still need to comply with some related to copyright, but they are more proportionate than what it was before. Same goes for taking out the foundation model uh, definition, and it's out. So okay. now we're talking about general purpose AI and generative AI, and specifically large generative AI. There is a tiered approach depending on the size, the reach, and the computational power, and the flops, yeah. which I found <laughs> out recently. Okay. Yes. So the processing power, let's say the computational power of the system, to be more objective. Mm -hmm. Energy, that is another important thing for our consortium, because one of the outputs is to create a, a standard for sustainability for a green AI. Now it's, it became broader. It used to be only for high risk and for generative AI in particular. Now it's included in the high-risk technical documentation, but also the Commission will create standards uh, for uh, energy-efficient training methodologies. So we're going that way. And uh, finally, there is a bit more clarity overall. Okay. Yeah. I know that I took a lot of time. No, but no. But in terms of comparison, and I'll just close yeah. with this, it will be the first, and I think the rest will follow. Yeah. And there is a tendency to follow. Um, only US moved a bit for um, voluntary standards, mm -hmm. but they are participating uh, uh, actively in the Council of Europe convention that mirrors the AI Act and will have a bigger reach. And they seem to be following, so they won't be regulated by us, but they will feel that they're yeah. interviewing. Okay. Yeah, no, it was a very complete answer. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate that. And regarding that, uh, regarding the, your role in Center for Responsibility, I address one question to Paulo. So at deep learning sessions, we've been following the, the center for a long time. And we want to know, because we know that the Center for Responsible AI is mainly focused on the, the companies and research centers that are part of the consortium. And we wanted to know if there are some conclusions also that you can share uh, for every company outside of the consortium that would help them also follow some responsible AI uh, or some strategies to uh, achieve responsible AI. So, yeah, so it was a, a year of learnings. So we did the kickoff of the center, I think it was on January 20 uh, last year. And um, so uh, we have uh, concluded four quarters so we have uh, still eight to go <laughs> so, <laughs> which is like a, a forcing function yeah. and, and these four quarters they just disappeared uh, in time very very quickly uh, so uh, we started um, uh, and uh, I don't know exactly the the, 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 the these numbers uh, from memory I, I could look into the notes but just to give you an idea we had quite a, a big number of startups that initially were just developing their products alone mm -hmm. uh, and the, the the architecture of the center is about joining a startup with a research center at least and uh, one or more industry leading companies that bring the problems the real world problems so it's we call like a, a product pod that is mm -hmm. a combination of these three roles uh, so we have the problem, we have the, the research being done on, on, on that domain, and we have the startup that accelerates uh, that, and it's great to see Miguel from uh, Neural Shift here, uh, over there. It's one of the startups that is accelerating the, the development of, of, of products. Uh, and so we started um, with quite a big group of startups that were just developing their products by themselves, but then, uh, 
the first event was like what we call the matchmaking event uh, and it was really it really looked like matchmaking because uh, or more like a wedding because we had uh, <laughs> yes, those I round remember. tables <laughs> uh, and so uh, like those tables you see on weddings and then we we have put people uh, together uh, that we believed would just uh, go on a date afterwards, <laughs> uh, like uh, Carlos Amaral from Pribera and uh, Bial, uh, Teresa Silveira, and we tried to organize the, the tables uh, like that. So the result was very, very positive. Uh, so after that, uh, for example, Bial is now working, uh, uh, or Pribera is working with Bial on, on a product. Um, we have NeuralShift uh, developing a product together with VDA uh, and applied to, to the law. Uh, and, um, and, and so uh, this process evolved and uh, we reached the end of 2023 with zero startups you know, working, working alone. So I think now we have around eight or, or uh, not eight, but six, six startups that um, are collaborating uh, with research centers mm -hmm. and industry leading companies, which is really an amazing experience because each speaks a different language. <laughs> so uh, the industry leading company, and in this case, I'm talking about uh, Sonai, uh, about uh, Group Stana, uh, about um, uh, two hospitals, the Hospital São João and the Hospital uh, da Luz, uh, and then and then Bial. Um, and so they really speak a different language, which is really very, very interesting. So for example, Bial is very interested in uh, addressing drug discovery and uh, and Sizuk, uh, <laughs> there's, yeah. a, there's a student from from Sizuk that is uh, has made some advances on, on mm -hmm. drug discovery, and just by getting them together, now we have a, a research initiative that is really solving that that problem. And so uh, the, the the big balance that that I can make of 2023 was that really this this we sparked all all these collaborations uh that really uh, make the product more focused on real world problems um and that also connects um the the startup with research centers and in the beginning it was very very fun to see because I did a tour, now I'm kind of doing sometimes a tour by Portugal, I go to <laughs> the north, I pass, I always go to Coimbra, uh, and then I also stop at Pedro dos Leitões also, so, <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, I know, I'm already, I'm, yeah, I'm kind of uh, uh, well known there. And, um, and, to, and, and when I started these tours, uh, I would go to the um, startups, uh, mm -hmm. and I can say sit with, uh, with, for example, Sword Health in Porto. And I thought, so have you already worked with uh, research centers? So what do you think about, you know, joining um, uh, forces with the research center? Ah, uh, no, we, we, we are a startup. We have to move, move very fast. We, we don't, we don't uh, have time to lose. Okay, it was, was interesting. Okay. Uh, and, and then we went to talk with research centers, and research centers, well, you know what? What we want is to publish papers, to, you know, to, to have more students, mm -hmm. to have more degrees, and, and so on. Uh, yeah, that thing about products is that's too hard for us. It's something that, you know, wow, we don't, we don't <laughs> kind of. Uh, but then over time, we started uh, breaking this barrier. And, um, and it was very interesting on uh, November 25th on our annual event to see the same Andrea from Sword Health uh, talking with uh, Sizuk and it's like uh, spinning off an idea that Sizuk is going to explore uh, to kind of de-risk that, that idea yeah. in terms of research, which mm -hmm. I think is something very powerful. So the startups have a possibility to partner, for example, uh, NeuralShift is partnering with Ineskid. There's a, a group from Bruno Martins there on NLP, and, and that is really accelerating the development. So it's like the startup is being extended with a research team that they don't need to pay, so this is yeah. everything is paid, <laughs> and that can de-risk the product and, and can lead to, to um, you know, a competitive advantage in, in the end. And so, uh, in summary, um, the, the balance of 2023 was about forming these this collaborations, uh, always grounded on, on, on real, real world uh, scenarios. scenarios. And so we already have some kind of amazing stories like Sword Health uh, launching with Hospital de São João, that was also the result of this consortium, their product that is going to help people to recover from a, a surgery um, uh, remotely, so uh, <laughs> at their home. Uh -huh. uh, and so um, this is going to be amazing because people will not 
will, will not need to, to, to move into the, to do the uh, physical therapy. Uh, so they, they, it's going to democratize physical therapy, which is really important. That's, that's, a, that's an amazing product story that resulted from, from the consortium. Uh, and I could yeah. tell more, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, uh, it's really interesting. Yeah, I think one conclusion is that bringing like, the product to real, uh, real scenarios will actually help. Uh, yeah, but but, let's, yeah. but yeah, let, yeah, yeah. let go, me say go. one thing, because I didn't completely answer yeah, yeah, your, yeah. your question. Please. So uh, what can other partners yes. benefit from, from what you are doing? So the consortium is open, uh -huh. uh, so we have uh, uh, an open uh, model. Uh, so we have like the, the core uh, you know, uh, members, but, but it's open. So we want to grow the consortium, we want to bring more uh, industry leading partners. Uh, for example, Brisa, is, it was announced publicly. Uh, they went to, to join, they have problems in the domain of mobility. Uh, for example, they went uh, to solve the problem of counting people inside a car, mm -hmm. okay? Because they went to change the, what you pay in the, in the toll based on the number of people. So if more people are in the car, you will pay less. Yeah, okay. Okay, so which, which is interesting. And so we went to, to bring more industry leading companies. But for this to work, we need to have more startups that will address these problems. And of course, we need to have the research centers yeah. to address the challenges in, in these domains. Okay. And so, yeah, so it's open and uh, everyone yeah. is welcome to okay. uh, join the conversation. Yeah. So talking about great products, let's talk a bit about large language models and ChatGPT. We saw two trends last year, I would say. It's like models going very big, very big and also trying to make it really small so that you can have them on your phone, for example. Um, so I would like to address to Hrisa this question. What are the advances on balancing this? Because we want the benefits from both sides, right? Can we do it? Uh, what, what do we have there? Um, yeah. We do, definitely. But um, so I would say, I wouldn't say that um, large language models are kind of stopping and okay. kind of we're still seeing larger models uh, with the addition of multimodality uh, so we're adding more um, capabilities to them um, but yes it was really impressive that we're also advancing a lot in how quickly we can quantize them adapt them to smaller sizes so that we can use them for more targeted tasks um, are they going to become just one thing where we have something very portable but equally um, Powerful. capable? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure because I think we're still seeing large language models that are so fluent and they can address a lot of different tasks and we're seeing very impressive approaches to perfect them, tuning them for specific tasks. Um, and for now it seems that they um, occupy different uh, strands of research, mm -hmm. um, but they're interacting with each other. And we're also seeing out of attempts to um, have this um, federated approaches uh -huh. where we use the cloud or we use distributed systems to account for all the amount of processing that we would need. And this allows us also to downsize a lot. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely an exciting direction for the future, mm -hmm. but I think for now we're going to keep seeing both trends okay. evolving. For me, this is really interesting and it's great that now we have all these models adapted very quickly to different tasks and adopted by companies for different products. Mm -hmm. I think it's unique in like the speed that it's happening. Yeah. And this is that it's raising, but still. <laughs> yeah, no, I completely agree. I like to think that there will not be one solution for everything because it's way more fun and there is more, much more opportunity and much more research. Otherwise, if you have one solution, well, that would be done, right? Uh, if you could balance it perfectly, right? Uh, so on quantization of networks, uh, do you, can you share some insights? How do we reduce the, the size of ChatGPT? Oh. <laughs> um, I mean, there are different approaches. Quantization yeah. is one approach. We have seen a lot of approaches that use adapters. So we're, we're adding small components and we're essentially very selectively adapting few parameters of a network that has billions of parameters. 
and then there are there is a lot of research on federated systems as well mm -hmm. where we're trying to distribute um we also uh, there are also process on separating what can be produced by the model and also retrieved from memories. So we okay. have a combination of retrieval. There are a lot of exciting directions to explore. And there is also work that is linked to the um, hardware capabilities, right? Okay. As well, when we have to link to smaller devices mm -hmm. and things like that. So of course, evolution of this also allows also us dependent. to yeah. have stronger models on smaller devices. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons why we want small models is because these big models are very non-sustainable. They're very impactful on the, on the environment. And uh, regarding that, I would like to ask uh, Katerina, you've been involved in several projects regarding climate, right? Uh, and AI and climate. So what were the developments in 2023 regarding this? And I would like to, to know if we finally reached the point that these advances in climate AI actually overcome the negative impact that ChatGPT has been having on our daily lives. Well, that, that is a goal. <laughs> <laughs> well, more than balance, even uh, overbalance yeah. that goal of uh, um, taking care of the footprint. And now it's like a hype. Everyone says that is uh, carbon neutral, and we are. <laughs> we have companies doing a lot of silly things so that they can wear that brand, saying that they are carbon neutral. Uh, what we do, uh, we we have some. We have had some opportunities to to do some contributions there. So regarding climate, I think one of our research areas we call it smart farming. And it's a really interesting uh, area of a pro uh, area of application because uh, you a priori wouldn't say that there would be very technical people there or tech savvy people there, but there are. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, uh, I think Portuguese farmers are really interested in making their their um, their production more technological. And uh, they are aiming at sustainability in a way that I was amazed. So when I talk to them, they say, now we are paid by production. So we have something like a square kilometer or a square acre, as they say, of course, of uh, production. And I want to know how many, how many kilograms can I have of corn or whatever I put there. But uh, usually there is seldom the care to know what is my footprint. Mm. If I have a big farm, do I keep the trees? Do I take the trees off? Do I change the rivers? Do I put everything without any, any everything plain so that the production is maximized? And that makes a, a lot of greedy farmers. Uh, and what they asked us to do, and that's what our, we are collaborating in, is on defining biodiversity indexes mm -hmm. that are supported by technology. So we have sensors, we have images, we have videos with drones, and the idea is to detect which species there are, the level of each one, and if new species appear or these species disappear. And the idea would be to propose a biodiversity level that would be calculated per farm or per parcel. And if a farmer, now they have already a carbon footprint that they have to comply with, but they, they, they think it's really not enough. So they, they outreach to, in fact, they outreach to, 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 for us to help them, and I think it's also a, a mobilizing uh, agenda. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, I hope for a lot of things also, not only in the Center for Responsible AI, but in, so that people will have some impact in their in their life. The other one is rather technical. This is a societal mm -hmm. application. The other is more technical, it's from the civil engineering area. And here the problem is really low data. And the idea they have is that, well, civil engineering is a hard engineering, so it's not soft. <laughs> so you have to build buildings that don't don't fall apart. <laughs> so there are some euro codes. Good. Yes, I would like that. <laughs> and they have to comply to those to those codes. But those codes have really 
uh, fixed uh, levels of uh, climate interaction. So when you build a building, you also have to take into account the wind in the place where you are building the building or the snow because the snow is heavy. And with climate changes, those models start to mm -hmm. fail because you have bursts that are not uh, predicted by codes. Mm -hmm. So they asked us to extrapolate the data they have so that climate change could be taken into consideration in the buildings. And again, it's really interesting because the, what they asked us is they have engineered a sustainability index, like yeah. traditional engineering. They make some interpolations, they found an index, and now they cannot explain it, and they cannot be sure it will work always. So they asked us to do some generative uh, processes to build data sets that can be used for Eurocodes to be uh, improved. So uh, in, in the University of Coimbra, there's also an excellent research center in civil engineering, and they are uh, really interested in defining also standards. So you could also be interested in them <laughs> <laughs> for 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 the civil engineering. So th those are the two the two the two areas that we work on, on climate. Well, it's it's involving climate okay. yes, yeah. and the environmental. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for sharing uh, this great research that is being done in Portugal. And by speaking of so, let's talk about AI in Portugal. Um, and now I address one question to Francisco, and is about the AI strategy in Portugal, which is a big thing for all of us, I, I would assume, because we are in Portugal. Um, and what I would like to know is, uh, well, FCT has a role in this strategy, right? And I would like to know how the execution of this strategy plan has been developed during the, the years. The goal is 2030. So where are we at right now? Uh, so so the, there is a strategy, indeed, it was designed uh, three, four years ago, five years ago. Um, of course, these strategies uh, for AI designed four years ago, <laughs> what, what can we say? I mean, it's, it's, of course, something that gets dated very fast. Also, it's important to have strategies with the budget associated, which was not really the case. So the strategy is being renewed by a big team, uh, some uh, close to, to this consortium. And I think, I think it's, it's something that will pop up soon, I can imagine. But, but uh, um, um, frankly, I, I think now, th given that we are, we are in this political turmoil, I'm not really sure mm -hmm. if there will be another one. But, but it's, uh, it's important also to see, um, okay, FCT by itself has also tried to, to play a role in this. Of course, the, our budget is pretty small compared to what would be needed for a real national strategy. So we have our, our small little strategy that is designed, well, first of all, it is designed to be close to the problem that uh, Paulo has mentioned here. So, so the goal here is to not so much to look at FCT as an institution that interacts uniquely with research units, and that would be has been typically the tradition. So, we, we are trying to uh, embrace every place that we do with science, and this is of course it goes from research units, it goes to university, it goes to non-academic entities which of course includes private companies. And by doing this is seeing research as this complex ecosystem where you have all these profiles. Mm -hmm. And also we need also to bridge this gap. So this gap that's producing papers, tum -tum, and, and why should I do this? Why uh, should I lose my time creating a prototype or a product? Why should I do this? So this implies that we also need to change the instrument. So we have been doing this in the last year. So we started, so FCT has a set of instruments regarding uh, research careers, which is essentially PhD, postdoc, 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 <laughs> until you get sick of it and you decide to do something else. So, so we are trying to, to, to change a bit the scope and try to find a way to create two tracks of instruments. So you do have PhDs, you ha do have postdocs for early careers, and then you go further 
and you became permanent, permanent somewhere, so we launched the so-called FCT tenure program to do so. But at the same time, we have another track, which is not to then PhDs. Okay. And this is something that we put very much effort in creating this match between what should be a PhD outside academia, academia. and by meaning outside doesn't mean that academia, academia is out. It's just like you have a problem of interest for a company, for, for instance, or a hospital or a public entity, and you have a supervisor inside the academia and a supervisor outside academia. And the, the PhD student works as a bridge. Mm -hmm. And this provides diversity afterwards on the paths that you are having, but also this intersectorial mobility, which is something that FCT should work for. So this was the first part. Then we launched the non-academic chairs, which is something that we launched in November. It is pretty important. It's very, very, really important that we have and Babel chairs and, and uh, 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 Hospital X chairs in, at university mm -hmm. and so forth. And that in the middle, we do need to launch another instrument that we hope to, to launch in the next months, which is the non-academic postdoc or the traditional mm -hmm. SEC, with okay. non-academic SEC. So, and the principle is exactly the same, is to promote uh, liberty, freedom, in terms of what you mean by a researchers. We are broadening the concept, what is a researcher by doing this and allowing this movement. At the same time, we need to, to change research assessment, of course. Yeah. So we cannot expect that FCT looks at researchers that are doing a paper in the morning and the prototype in the afternoon, and you say, I only look at the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so we are changing research assessment in such a way that all this diversity can be included and we did this since last year, so we introduced the narrative CVs and so forth, so publishing 1,500 papers is not really the goal of our assessment, so we are tailoring, tailoring the, the principles in, 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 that, in that direction. And this is actually important for both sides. For, for companies, of course, you have access to talent, and this is really, really important. You have access to what really means in this context in the area of AI, it's even better because you can have the entire value chain in a single project, from fundamental to the top uh, technology application. And you can have everything, and you can have all the spectrum also where universities can contribute, the co companies can con contribute. So it's really nice. For universities, of course, this is precious for many reasons. One of the obvious reasons is that this idea of technology transfer, which is typically thought as unidirectional, mm -hmm. it doesn't work so much in AI, okay? Yeah. So the, the knowledge is, most of the cases, not so much in, in <laughs> university. So, yes. so you need this breeding, cross-breeding of, of goals and, and knowledge that is pretty important here. And, and this is Im important here, and now we have to do some dedicated work related with, with AI. So we have our tiny small strategy for AI, which is, so in the last year we created a small team that is shooting <laughs> for projects all everywhere to increase the budget for, of FCT. We are quite successful on this, so we managed to get into PRR, uh, the, PRR, yeah, the yeah. resilience plan. We managed to get money from health, defense, and other areas uh, of the public sector and AI is, is a, an area where you can where you can have an effort here so we managed to to increase the budget of, of FCT by 100 million mm -hmm. so, so it's something that, uh, that is, 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 is reasonable and among these we have these access that we are tailing uh, uh, trying to, to, to bid on which is grants project grants on AI mostly in connection with the public sector or companies. And uh, you have another axis, which is pretty important here for everyone here, which is advanced computing. So we have a strategy for advanced computing. So we have a new supercomputer uh, on. It's not really tailor-made for AI. We mm -hmm. are trying to increase now upgrading it already for 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 this particular sector. Mm -hmm. So the Ocalian is, 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 so if you are not aware, so basically, FCT is part of something called the Euro HPC mm -hmm. network in, in mm -hmm. Europe. So it's a network of supercomputers. So by having one, we are uh, we have dedicated computing time uh, in Portugal, but they also have access to the entire mm -hmm. network. And, and most of these supercomputers do have 
a partition for accelerated uh, HPC or mm -hmm. AI compute or whatever. So, so it's important to have access to this. And as a result, we are also trying to make it more bottom up such that consortiums like this one have a role in the governing board of the computing power of in Portugal. Mm -hmm. So we are creating this year the National Advanced Computing Center, which will be something like a club. So NCP will fund and then we'll open a club where everyone can get in, companies, universities, who would actually need the, the resources. And now the accesses, access and the strategies will be defined by, by this, this group, by this mm -hmm. consortium. So it's something that we hope that until March, we have this NAC, okay. the National uh, Advanced Computing Center working. So and so the last corner of this triangle is data. So we need to have a, da um, a strategy for um, research data. Mm -hmm. And this also touches AI, of course, uh, repositories and, and, and okay. of data and so forth. It touches every area of research these days. So we are building so not only uh, repositories that are public for everyone using doing research in Portugal, but also to have curators of data also funded okay. by FCT on this on this axis. So this is a bit the idea is not a strategy mm -hmm. that for yeah. a national strategy. I hope the national strategy will be built uh, next uh, in the, in the following uh -huh. year. I think we need probably a center for AI in Portugal, yeah. mostly related also with the needs for regulation and certification mm -hmm. that pro probably will pop up. But I think this is something that uh, okay. we'll soon figure out. Yeah. Okay. It's nice to hear that there are people working on the, the strategy, AI strategy in Portugal. Mm -hmm. And regarding that, uh, there's one point that is very dear to us. Uh, deep learning sessions as a group started in Lisbon, but some years ago we started thinking, well, there's a bunch of research done outside of Lisbon, and we should also bring visibility to that research, so we d decide to decentralize. Katarina is representing here uh, research that is done outside the hub of Lisbon as a research mainly in Coimbra. What I want to hear from you is this AI strategy, what do you think is missing there, or is there something missing there for, for helping decentralizing? There's a big a work and in inclusion in the AI strategy, but not so much in the centralization, not a big word. Even though there's some creative communities for digital competence or something like that, I tried to access the website and it's down now. So, well, I would like to know your opinion on this. Uh, I think you are right. <laughs> there is no... I don't think that is on the radar of every, anyone. <laughs> so... Uh, I think that uh, in Portugal, everyone that does not live in Lisbon thinks that the people that live in Lisbon think that Lisbon is Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> and um, even in Porto, they think that sometimes. And uh, we had uh, in the Center for Responsible AI, uh, we had last week or two weeks ago a workshop on fairness. And the giveaway of that workshop was that we are not sure how are you going to make all models fair, but it's the most, the most important thing is that you have to be aware that that is a necessity. And I, would, I think with that the centralization, it's not going to be solved anywhere soon, but it would be really important that it, people that took decisions know that that is a necessity, mm -hmm. that are the... There, is, uh, there are people working outside of these big centers. And I, I, I laughed before when Paulo said he was touring the, 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 <laughs> the country. And he really does that. And the first time he did that, we were all surprised. <laughs> because no one from Lisbon comes there, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, it's, it's even more regional because I am in several uh, associations. I am with the Portuguese Association for Pattern Recognition. Mm -hmm. And I was also president of the IEEE Portuguese section. And whenever an event was in Lisbon, people from Lisbon went there and from all over the country. When an event was in Porto, people from Porto and above <laughs> Doro would go there, maybe Aveiro. But if the event was in Coimbra, <laughs> it was really hard to for people. people to go there. Yeah. 
so it's rare, and I thank you for doing that. So, so um, uh, because our country is small, but th those those differences exist. So, but for instance, things like the Center for Responsible AI that has people that are from all over, and even companies that are from different places is really important, uh, because even the young people, they are not from all from Lisbon. Yeah. So they don't have all to come to Lisbon to succeed and to have a role. So even to, to use all the resources that the country has, it is more than obvious that ha that has to be done. But um, so I am not sure, I'm not a politician, how that <laughs> can yeah. be done. But one way would be to have sessions like this in, in, in different places. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, thank you very much for sharing your opinion. Um, yeah, we, we, we have a commitment with decentralization. Um, so we really want, we are trying to do at least one event outside of Lisbon, uh, which is the best we can do uh, because we are you just You know volunteers. that in Coimbra you are welcome for sure. <laughs> we, we did last year actually. <laughs> so um, yeah, um, and like personally, I would like to see, for example, the south of Portugal having some, some work on it uh, because it's really hard for me. I come, I come from the south, from Alente, so uh, sometimes I, I think if I could bring something there, and it's really hard. Um, and another thing, for example, uh, Epia this year was in Azores. Yes, 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 it was so lovely. It was yes, lovely. Yes, so it's super interesting to see these decentralization the of uh, uh, AI events in Portugal. I think it's necessary. Yes. But you know that uh, Epia was uh, in Fayal. It mm -hmm. was really lovely. And uh, it was a big success because we... Usually, uh, la the year before it was in Technico and it was yeah. uh, between 60 and 80 people and we say, oh, we'd be so lucky if you had uh, that people and we have mo 150 mm -hmm. uh, submissions, okay. so we had almost 100 uh, papers and m more people were there. Okay. And very, very few people from Lisbon went. Oh, I think really? last year it was in Lisbon, so they were used to it. Okay. <laughs> so they didn't <laughs> want to go there. Yeah. So, but uh, the, the, that idea of the democratization also goes through that. Yeah. In, in fact, during a peer, there was a session. Uh, Nuno Muniz uh, mm -hmm. is now in the States, but he's from Fayal. Yeah, so yeah. we organized a session like this, but for people, regular people. Mm -hmm. We didn't even tell anyone in the conference because <laughs> the room was small and it was full and everyone was afraid of AI. Oh, really? It was a really hot session. Interesting. Because that's why I say it is democratized. Yeah. Everyone was afraid of AI in that room. From artists to programmers, everyone was afraid. So it was, I think there's a work to be done there on the literacy and I... I yeah. I congratulate you for your for your efforts. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, next question, it's about uh, a polemic um, that happened last year. And it's about retention, uh, talent creation and talent retention in Portugal. It's hard. It's a struggle right now in Portugal to grab the talent. So one question I would like to ask Hrisa is, well, you made your whole education outside, but you came to Portugal. What made you come to Portugal? That's, um, that's a very good question. Um, so I, I came to Portugal because I saw an opportunity to work uh, as a postdoc at the time at a very good group. Uh, I was admiring the work uh, Andre Martins was doing at the group at the time. So it was a really good opportunity. Um, and I think providing opportunities is the key way to retain talent. And providing good opportunities, which means both, uh, it, it requires a few steps, right? <laughs> it requires um, more opportunities for tenure positions. So it was really nice to hear uh, about the FCT initiative. Um, and it requires also um, aiming for more collaborations. So I was a bit surprised with uh, that um, discussion about whether the um, uh, collaboration with uh, CMU, for example, was up in the air, because for me this is really useful. The there will always be some people who will prefer to 
go and live and work outside Portugal. And I think this will happen whether or not they're given the opportunity to go to another university. But at the same time, it's really important to give students the opportunity to collaborate abroad and help them return to the country, uh, knowing that they will not lose uh, the potential to do great research, the potential to still collaborate with other universities abroad. I think this is very important. Um, and uh, they will have an exciting academic life or life in an industry, but still doing interesting research. Um, so for me, both of these things, I know that allocating budget or reallocating <laughs> budget um, is always a challenge. But for me, um, investing in both collaborations with other universities and um, providing opportunities, which of course means permanent positions or good positions to people in the country, is key for this. And we see also in Europe uh, that more and more universities uh, are encouraging students to, or even forcing students, PhD students to spend a year abroad or six months abroad. So I think this is a tendency that we're seeing more and more, mm -hmm. and it is important to follow it and try to strengthen bonds with uh, other universities. It brings mm -hmm. more research, more opportunities, more funding yeah. most of the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah, thank you very much for sharing. Uh, well, yeah, th this is a really problem right now, right? Um, now, in a, this, this section was about polemics, and the big polemic in last year was some Altmans. Uh, so I would like to ask Paulo, what is the conclusion of all these things, of all this polemic about, around uh, Sam Altman? We know that now OpenAI has a big role and has a lot of power, but the, the people inside also have a, a lot of power. And they're taking decisions based on their beliefs most of the times. And some of them are techno-optimists, uh, and others are uh, agree that we should stop developing everything. So everyone is talking about these uh, opinions, futurology. What are your opinions around this whole polemic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. And, and it, it's a bit disturbing uh, that a person uh, in the world, uh, in San Francisco, it's not, you know, it's not even a region; it's just a city, <laughs> <laughs> has a, has you know that that power in in the whole world. So, Sam Altman was uh, like being received on many countries as a chief of state last year, <laughs> which was like <laughs> something like very surprising. <laughs> but yeah, but can I can I just add two things to? Yeah. to just said about the, because uh, just to emphasize this, and uh, and also uh, about how the, the center is is uh, is designed and uh, and how we will look into the future and in terms of decentralization. Uh, so it, it's it's amazing that um, you know uh, and and this is what made everything possible that like the the, the founding. Uh, startups of, of the center uh, are one from Coimbra, <laughs> so that's Fidzai, okay, a, yep. a unicorn, uh, another from Puerto, Sword House, and then and Babel, that is much smaller than, than these two. Uh, but so we have the, the three uh, cities, the three, uh, you know, represented, and I think this has been very important. So this shows uh, that really uh, you know, all Portugal can really create amazing startups and really startups that that are growing uh, so for example in Babel exports 99 percent of of what what builds uh, also for Fidzai, also for for Sword Health. so really and and it's decentralized the the model by itself though this is just one, one one point and we want to to make that even even stronger for example critical software is also from Coimbra and they also went to to join the consortium you know as, as we were saying it's it's an open consortium so that was a point and then uh, regarding what what chris has said uh, and i was just taking notes because i really love to listen to these uh, answers about what makes people come to and stay in portugal uh, and we have some some success stories on on that respect and uh, and for that i think it's the the, the challenge uh, having also and this is this always comes up that having some kind of champions in cer certain areas. Uh, I think Andre Martiz is one of our champions on uh, natural language processing that really attracts talent uh, from around the world. So I think the challenge is something that is, is very important. Uh, then uh, I think being 
internationally connected in terms of you know being connected with CMU. I think it's very important being connected with Euro HPC network in Europe and also the Alice network. I think it's this feeling of belonging to a bigger network uh, of talent of excellence uh, people uh, around around Europe and and, and the, in the US. I think it's also important that connection. But and then also. In the end, and this related with what uh, Francisco said, uh, people need to be well paid. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think we have to look into salaries. Uh, salaries is really a, the, 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 you know, a big, big issue. Uh, and, uh, and I think the initiative that the FCT launched about PhDs at companies really addresses that. So we already have three PhDs there at Enbabel. Um So we didn't yet benefit from, from the partnership with the FCT on this program, but we are like just starting to explain everyone uh, about the existence of this program. Uh, I know that Preveren, for example, is interested in, in one thing that Francisco, you mentioned the other day about scholarships related with health, like FCT and health applications, the Ministry of Health and FCT. And so what we need, and I think the center can contribute to that, is to make the process more simple, more easy to understand, more, you know, like decoding, because sometimes the regulations, I know that FCT cannot communicate in this <laughs> way, in uh, more like a easy going style <laughs> but i think we, we can work on that in terms of communication so that in the end and this was the main reason why we, we created this big consortium was to retain talent in in portugal so this is really because these startups they will only survive if they have the best ai talent in the world if not they will not be competitive and so we really need to to, to retain that um uh, to, to retain uh, i think francisco wants yeah, to just, just uh, add a, a few uh, points regarding the what Paulo just said. So, given that you have several companies here, I, I would like to to also push forward this idea. So, so the, we will have in this March again these these number of uh, PhD grants to be uh, delivered to to non-academic entities, so in collaboration with non-academic entities. What the FCT uh, did last year, and we will repeat this year, is these calls for uh, manifestations of interest to, to call for interest mm -hmm. from companies that would like to attract a PhD student, but they don't have a PhD student in mind. So they just, just drop a line to FCT. We have a, a, a database. We make this database available for potential students, such a way that we promote a better match with, with companies, but also uh, with students. And again, after that, they will contact each other and push forward and submit an application. Other aspect that is related with we heard what we heard now regarding international stuff, it's important that we also allow, it's important that when you arrive in Portugal, not only you have a stable position, and this is pretty important for us, but also to have uh, the means to go abroad again. So we are launching something that is agnostic with respect. So it's complementary to CMU Portugal and so forth that is working very well. Is, is to be agnostic regarding geography and regarding research area. Mm -hmm. So we are launching so-called FCT mobility plan. So basically we got money to, to, to make this. So uh, you, you are a researcher anywhere in Portugal, you just drop an abstract to FCT. You say, I would like to spend up to, from two months to 10 months in Brussels, for instance, you say, I would like to work with this person, this person is ready to receive me, and FCT will pay a month, monthly salary on top of your, of your, of your normal salary to be abroad and to, be, to stay there uh, for long-term stays. The goal here is to promote long-term stays. At the same time, the champions issue, we are launching something called ERC careers. The, the goal here is basically if, uh, Coimbra finds interesting to attract someone with a lot of money from ERC or, or, or something like that, they just have the comfort that FCT will transfer immediately 700,000 euros for, the, for Coimbra to attract this person. Of course, it's basically giving 50% more than an ERC grant. So it's something that allow Uni Portuguese universities to have a more aggressive scouting strategy and by doing this attract the champions mm -hmm. like Andre Martins to bring uh, and you of course to, to, to come here mm -hmm. to Portugal and stay and stay in Portugal. So it's something that we are launching this year not because we didn't manage to launch it mm -hmm. before because we don't have the, didn't have the money but this is something that is important also to keep in mind if you are a researcher. Sir. <laughs> yeah.
thank you okay, very much. And then yeah. just uh, trying to be brief and answering your yes, question directly exactly. um, about the power of, um, of open AI. Uh, and I think that, uh, yeah, that's the, that's a success story of a, of a product company. So what, what open AI was able to do uh, Uh, at at a small scale because the team was was small was really to make a product that people loved and and that's why it it spread initially and this is only possible i think when the, the teams are, are are small and you have the the, the right uh, talent so uh, as as uh, uh, we we talk i think uh, chatgpt was the result of a combination uh, of of three factors so first the the scale of the of the model but then the other two were the elimination of toxic content uh, and uh, the kind of uh, alignment, reinforcement mm -hmm. learning using human yeah. feedback, and then ease of use. So it made AI accessible to everyone because you know you, you can nowadays interact with AI using uh, our our own, own language. And so uh, that's the, the success story. The thing that uh, we can now discuss in, in a more speculative way is that uh, that was also the result of uh, open research. So, no, yeah. open AI uh, was the combination of advances, of research advances that were developed, uh, you know, in open conferences, you know, all the researchers were publishing uh, papers like attention is all you need, you know, very famous papers that all combined led to, you know, to, to the advances, to the scientific advances of, of open AI. And now they are becoming a closed research company. <laughs> so, yeah. And so, uh, and, and, and so they, are, they, are, they receive instructions not to publish. Uh, and so this is something that Meta and Yen Lekun is talking a lot uh -huh. because uh -huh. Meta is staying because they are lagging behind for, they have good reasons to do this. Uh, and so they advocate themselves as an open research company. And so it's going to be very interesting to follow this year, this kind of different strategies. So people from Meta publishing more, you know, in a sense, you know, fostering a, a sharing community, uh, also being leveraged by the, the open source models and so on. Uh, and then see how um, uh, even Google, Google, they are also like, uh, you know, closing their, their models. So they are not sharing so much as they were sharing before. Uh, and so uh, I think the power of open AI, uh, let's see, Uh, how long it, it lasts from a scientific perspective. Mm -hmm. I think from a product perspective, they will uh, still uh, keep the, the lead because they, they have a really a great team on, on that respect. Sam Altman is, uh, is brilliant on, on that. So he's like the, the, the CEO, the product CEO that you know, understands users very well. And, and that's why uh, Satya Nadella from Microsoft really, you know, <laughs> is almost like you know, <laughs> dating Sam Altman. Yeah. But <laughs> because Sam Altman is, okay, yeah. <laughs> No, I want you to finish that sentence. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> That's okay. So um, now I have two extra questions, more about the future. And the first one is addressed to Jakovina and is about legislation, once again, regulation. What is the strategy of Portugal to comply with this AI Act? Uh, and uh, regarding not just that, what is the future of AI regulation? For example, um, RAG or inputs, like can, can I take something out of the internet and use it as input, as a prompt or as a few shot learning for uh, chat GPT and that would be fine because AI Act doesn't cover that, right? In short, yes. In short, so yes? Okay. I will start for the, the, the easiest part, that is the what Portugal will do. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's say that everything works out and we have a regulation by the end of February. Uh, in principle, all member states, including Portugal, because it's a regulation, so it's immediately applicable to all member to states. Everyone. You don't, you might have an implementing act, you will have an implementing act, but you don't have to, to transpose it, so you don't need to have an internal law in order for it to be applicable. And Portugal will need to appoint um, or create, because of budget and legal issues, probably they will appoint uh, one authority that will be responsible for monitoring compliance and also promoting transparency, training, skill sets, and so on, will be also uh, have a, will also have a very important role in regulatory sandboxes that are mandatory. Um, it's very probable that that authority will be ANACOM. It's, there is nothing official, and, yeah. but they are positioning themselves, themselves because of Digital Services Act, so again, the digital realm, to be the ones regulating. So we will, it will be one thing that we will see, and that member states will have two years to, to decide And then they will also be able to set penalties, although the penalties are already in the AI Act. So that is the part for the country. 
and it's very much linked with the AI strategy of the country as well, mostly in relation to regulatory sandboxes. So you have an innovation incentive that would also have specific incentives for startups and uh, SMEs in order to participate sandboxes, promote sustainable AI use cases, not only from the environmental component, but also from the social component, that they would have um, a, a, a bigger uh, facility in entering into um, those sandboxes. So that would be one part that it would mm -hmm. be very interesting to see, especially considering that Spain has already an authority there okay. and we are very close. Now, passing to the other question and trying to very briefly mention it, this has to do with copyright. And again, picking up on what I said before, a lot of Americanization in the conversation. If it's available online and everyone can access it, probably you are accessing it lawfully. So by using it as a prompt for something else, you're probably not violating anything. Yeah. Okay. Now, if for example, and this is part of the, of the class actions that we're seeing, especially from the US, with New York Times. New York Times is a subscription-based website. If I make available to a model in order to be trained or copied something that is protected by subscription, then I'm not, I, I did not make it available to the general public to do whatever. So that is the problem for European law and Portuguese law as well is the same, that you made something available that it was only limited to whomever had subscription to it, and then you made a copy out of it. The thing is, it might not even be a copy. If it's just trained from it, that is another thing. Mm -hmm. But in Europe, the problem is not that complex as it is in the US. Mm -hmm. There are already guardrails in place to facilitate all of us being able to use these models and whatever we have as means. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for that uh, quick answer. Uh, and going to the last question, I would like to hear from Francisco about all these ideologies around technology right now. We have this idea of techno-optimism, which has a manifest and all this. It's almost like a religion in a sense, because we, it's something you believe. Uh, there's also those that think AI will have another winter and they're expecting just that for happening. Um, so how can we talk about AI without falling into one of these uh, beliefs or can we? Uh, what what are your thoughts about that? I will try to be very very fast. Yeah. So, so uh, I think the the right thing is to to do not raise too much the expectations, but also to to enjoy the moment. I mean, what 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 we are living here. So so let, let's look back. We are f we are living the same thing that we lived 100 years ago with physics and quantum mechanics and so forth. And we also have these because of that. And we feel that everything is happening very fast. So it's very hard to extrapolate for the future. So the derivative is is immense. So let's enjoy it. Of course, if the derivative is, is, is huge, you can make huge errors, extrapolating, being extremely afraid and being super enthusiastic, and just, just enjoy. So what I, we say to, to our students is that oh, you are in computer science, the right time to be in computer science. Just enjoy it and, and, uh, and, and go for the run. I think, I think that's the, the most important thing. Again, yeah. it's perfect. That's, <laughs> a, that's just a, such a perfect uh, answer to finish. Um, uh, round table. So I would like just to ask you some final remarks that you might have, or if you want, you can also try to answer the same question. What we'll be talking about in one year from now? So we can start maybe from by Paulo. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So kind of predictions for uh, for 2020, 2024. So I think yeah, from um, from a kind of uh, society perspective. I think uh, one of the things that's going to happen and it's going to be generalized is about the, the democratization of creativity. So I think that AI uh, will allow you know any person uh, to be more creative. Uh, so it really lowers lowers the the barrier to you know create a text, create an image, create everything. I think I think we're going to see that. That uh, that trend, uh, uh, that trend very, very, it's going to be very, very visible. You know, like uh, superpowering everyone. You know, in terms of, of creativity, I think that's going to be something uh, important. Another, uh, uh, also from a society perspective, is about uh, on education. I think education uh, is going to progressively be transformed with uh, 
with the, um, uh, generative AI, with large language models. So uh, we have already seen the amazing work by the Khan Academy on that. I've, I've, I'm passionate about education. I'm always, you know, trying pitching uh, Ciencia Viva and, uh, you know, uh, schools to, to really, you know, introduce uh, chat GPT with the, with the students. So I think that's going to be also something that uh, is going to be transformative in terms of learning because uh, with uh, with a large language model, you know, you, you can have like a personal tutor yeah. uh, on your, on your yeah. pocket, uh, a tutor that knows what you don't know. So, uh, and, and, and so can you can really explore your curiosity and, and learn a lot. I'm trying to convince my kids to use it if, if, even if they suspect that what <laughs> ChatGPT says is not correct. Yeah. Uh, no, but it's real. Yeah, but, but I think that education is going to be. Then uh, more from a technological perspective, I think multimodality it's going to be a big trend. I think we're going to have large language models that, that are uh, multimodal. Uh, I think that uh, also uh, large language models alignment, uh, you know, on top of uh, open source models, are going to be a, a big trend, uh, even uh, on closed models. So I think that's going to be something essential. Uh, all uh, you know, big large language models are going to have to be, you know, in a sense aligned, or we will have. To to have the control of the alignment, because we cannot live in a world that is dictated from the from the big tech companies uh, or from some altmen. <laughs> so, uh, and so I think that's going to be a trend, and we're going to see that progressively. It was already in this case okay. some altmen specifically at Davos talking about that. And then an area that I think it's going to be more like risk in terms of predictions is agentic uh, AI. So to start having uh, uh, large language models that not only you know generate text and and then uh, diffusion models that, that generate images, but in the case of uh, um, text models that also interact Interacts. with external tools and uh, and you know you can just delegate on on, yeah. on on AI to book your next trip to London and it will take care of everything basically yeah. <laughs> I think but I think that's that's going to be still a challenge and but I think we're going to have we see some advances okay. on that domain. Okay, so Chrisa, yeah, yeah. Um, so after I this, after. <laughs> I agree with all of this, <laughs> I guess. Um, but I wanted to, to say also in terms of uh, involvement of in the society from the societal aspect that I expect we're going to see more and more participatory, like involvement of AI in more participatory processes. I noticed that already, like in the calls for Horizon projects and things like that, we have more and more calls on the social sciences domain that explicitly ask for the involvement of large uh -huh. language models or language tools in general yeah. and they emphasize the potential to improve participation to democratic processes etc so i think this will be an interesting aspect if it is handled yeah, properly yeah, yeah. um <laughs> and otherwise yeah a link <coughs> more with internet of things and um yeah. expanding the reach edge, of edge models computing, yeah. yeah okay Thank you very much, Katerina. <laughs> <laughs> Not much more to say. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I hope that when those personal agents book everything, they let me go instead. No, they don't go instead of me yeah. also. <laughs> and then tell me how it was. <laughs> <laughs> um, also on your Instagram. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they can have me there. As if I was there, that would be, that would be the, I could even uh, have, uh, they could even build emotions so that I was be feeling <laughs> there, okay. <laughs> so back to reality, I would say that, um, uh, I, I, I read it there, but it was, um, I, I think uh, the woman in the loop will be stressed, also because of the AI Act. But there are a lot of critical applications of AI, mm -hmm. and AI is getting into critical applications. Mm -hmm. And uh, the need for the woman in the loop yeah. will be massive. And not the woman in the loop just by saying OK to AI, or as not as the judges in the United States, that when they want to go against what an AI method said, they have a lot of work. But uh, a responsible human in the loop that knows what's happening and can critically analyze the, the, the decision that is proposed by the, the model. So I think this is important so that we don't derail. Yeah. And then models that have biases, for instance, uh -huh. uh, uh, that have blind spots because they have them, 
or our hallucinating models do not uh, uh, mm -hmm. act unlawfully, right? <laughs> yeah, that well, was a perfect pass to, to, uh, yeah. to close with the regulation. So for sure, uh, we will be talking about the enforcement of the AI Act. Yeah. Because it's fine that now probably we have the rules, but how we will implement them is an issue. And picking up exactly from Katarina Liftov, the thing is, the human in the loop part requires also training, and I'm returning it to you mostly. Uh, it has to do with how we share experiences and know-how, and it requires a certain level of, and we were talking about outside, multidisciplinarity to be able to do it. The human in the loop is not one human, it's many, and it's not uh, only uh, a lawyer or an engineer or an ethicist, it's all together sitting down to be able to discuss what does it mean explainability for me and what it means for you, how we can validate biases, how we can comply, how we can explain things to the, the people that are using the system in a way that they understand uh -huh. and not any of us. So uh, I think that will be um, a very big focus in the year to come. Uh, AI literacy and legal literacy of the AI Act and its enforcement. Interesting. And finally, Francisco. I would go also for, for the social part, the social AI part. So, so the fact that we are facing a new self-organized system where we have humans, populations comprised of humans and, and machines, the fact that we are already realizing that humans behave differently when they interact through machines, when they delegate their actions, they behave differently. So all of these are amazing research topics that will certainly be part of the research agenda of many, many uh, research centers. And this will have an impact f as a citizen, as a human, and putting human in the loop also brings these interdisciplinary challenges. And it, it will be nice to see AI beyond AI, the fact that it will open it and we'll start to address questions that are in psychology, that are in sociology, they are behavioral sciences mm -hmm. playing a role. So I think it will be good fun. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, so now we're open to questions. Uh, hi, my name is Inish. Um, I'm a bit concerned about voice cams and voice protection. And I think even uh, European Union maybe don't have uh, right now the right approach about if you make a patent of your voice but actually is really growing the scams in US about uh, voice patent and protection and I would like to know your opinion about that. Uh, someone has an opinion? Jakovina maybe. maybe. Yes, <laughs> maybe you can... When, they, when there are problems... Eh? <laughs> <laughs> the hard question. Yes. <laughs> Uh, it's true that one of the main risks of generative AI, and especially when it comes to voice generative AI, uh, it's uh, the increase of cybersecurity threats as a whole, including frauds. So in the AI Act, this will fall uh, already under certain rules. Uh, it won't be able to limit how it's used. That is the, the issue. That is a bit of a fine balance. Because if you were limiting the technology, let's say, and going back a bit to the philosophical part that also Luis was mentioning, the other side of uh, technological optimism is determinism. And uh, it's good to, to be skeptical, but uh, passing down to Ludist approaches and blocking entirely the technology to avoid one application, it will be impossible because we are not living in a risk-free society, right? So it's true. But in the AI Act, you have certain prohibitions. Uh, and certain obligations that they are put both in the in the face of the technology as such, and then for what you are describing, there will be additional obligations that they will come up during the enforcement as the technology develops from the side of, let's say, the telecommunications company, the bank that might be receiving the call, the hospital that might be receiving the call, to be able to analyze whether the voice belongs to a human or is AI generated? So it lives outside of the realm of who developed the, te the technology and mostly on how we can protect from new types of cyber threats that did not exist before. Yeah, another question there. My name is Roma. And yes, um, back then people used not AI approaches because it was, AI wasn't popular then, back then. And they used like statistic models, statistic models or heavy mathematical models. But uh, right now everyone uses AI for everything, like a hammer. 
And my question is, um, because of the IU regulation, many companies don't want to be regulated. So do you think they will go to the, back to the old approaches or not? To not, to not be affected of, by, by that? This is more like a prediction. Yeah. Yes, it's more, um, honestly, um, no one has the competitive advantage to let go of AI right now. So uh, I don't think that just because of the regulation, they will stop developing or using AI. There are actual more benefits in complying fast and using what you have, because there will be some time frame to comply, than letting go of it. Uh, and it was tested also a bit with GDPR, the, the faster companies complied with, even though the rules might have been complicated or stringent, the more benefits they acquired from market trust, trust in the, in the product, the model, the transparency of the company. So I think we will see something similar here instead of uh, a, a technological atavism and going backwards, let's say, to not using AI or not developing AI. But there will be maybe some other problems, like if the AI regulation, if you read the section, there is a point about high risk. And for example, your model will fall into this part and you cannot change it. It's impossible. So maybe you have to use other approaches to maybe use the domestic approaches or other statistical approaches to be compatible, to use this product, to build this product. The prohibited cases, they are prohibited because not because they're using AI, but because of the use case as such. Like, I don't think we could, let's say, arrive at a point where we will have social scoring permittable uh, if it didn't have AI. So uh, the use cases do not focus on having the technology in, but on the way that is used. So that you are not going to avoid being blocked out of the single market just because you are not using AI. So you think the uh, problem is not... The AI, so the problem is the users. Yeah, uh, the, this the is use the case. approach. This is okay. the approach of the regulation uh, throughout. Okay. Yeah. Uh, more questions. I would like to hear your questions. You know everything now, right? One here. Perfect. Hello, everyone. So my name is Andre from Front of Portugal. So I think this is also for Jacovina as well. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> Jacovina. Okay, I'm sorry we may to go. pile on, but I think may, we but can maybe let not. you go. <laughs> Maybe not. There, there might be some other perspectives because yeah, we're talking about regulation. Regulation is coming in. We all have to, to adapt. We have to have to comply. And now uh, I want to talk about certification. And, and so we, we know, for example, that the CE marking in many products are self, it's a self, uh, it's a self declaration, right? And in here, you think it will be the same because I have a personal view on this and I think you know a bit um, so that you know and you can keep track of everything because it's digital so it's easy it's not a product it's a physical product that it's a um, kid's toy it has a c marking and you are not sure you cannot audit that specific toy you just cannot the process for a prediction of ai you can unravel the whole thing back to, to where it came from and so i'm wondering uh, who will be that this entity that's that's gonna verify the compliance i think it's not certification but to verify the compliance and if you think it's possible, and it's, it, the um, thinking it's possible, also address to, uh, to the other members of the panel. In the, in the act, you have a, a specific section that is dedicated only to conformity assessments, and then voluntarily to be able to put the C marking to validate that you complied. Thing is, it has two tiers. There is one part that is living completely outside because it says it's already covered, and that is all the other product safety regulations applicable, including for marking purposes, and the commission. It has said that it will issue standards under the AI office and also the board that it has a scientific component supposed to support them in understanding this. But very similar to the approach when it comes to any sort of marking in the EU, uh, it, you, they will be created and they will be appointed, uh, certified bodies, notified bodies that can be within authorities part of them and then outside of the authorities and centralized at a European level under the EU AI office. So it'll be the same thing as it happens, let's say, with radio equipments uh, nowadays for the way that is certified. Again, notified bodies, certified bodies, public and private entities that they are able to certify. And then you will be putting the marking and keeping the records to prove the, the process. On when and how it will be implemented is within the two years time frame. So there are two years to, to have this process. But um, who will be able to validate it? That I cannot <laughs> reply <laughs> to. So anyone else that has a better idea of who will be able to assess AI? 
<laughs> I'm not sure. I, I, I can I can <laughs> I can speculate a little bit. Um, before, when you have some, for instance, ISO 9000, what you had was a multitude of companies that appeared just to help other companies complying, right? And you had a lot of paperwork from those companies uh, and a lot of s skepticism from those companies. I, I, I accompanied, accompanied some processes and they were really hungry with all the work they had. But in the aftermath, they, they had to concede that the result was positive. So I would say something similar will happen. There will be a lot of aids. A lot of companies will pro proliferate to help other companies uh, comply. That would be my, my bet. Any other opinions? We all want to hear <laughs> Paulo's opinion, I think. Yeah, so I was going to assess the, if the, 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 no, the, the model is compliant with the, with the regulation and so on. So what the AI Act refers to is two experts, right? It needs to be assessed by you know, the pool of experts that uh, will give their opinion. I don't know where the experts uh, that those experts are. So, so it's like, uh, it's something that has, is not, has not been uh, solved. Uh, so I'm, I'm really, um, uh, and I'm telling the, the team every day to wait for the first country that uh, <laughs> does that to see how it's going to really be implemented in, in, in practice. So a discussion, uh, I don't know how it fits the, the current AI Act, but discussion I'm, I, I was, I participated in, I was more like assisting the discussion was about if the model is going to be more like regulating the process. Uh, and so a discussion in the, in the context of the Claire, um, a network, uh, of AI. Uh, and so if the process was, it's more like regulating the process, uh, to be sure that the companies um, that are developing high risk AI are following a certain process and they document everything and all that, or if it's really regulating the product, the, the model itself in, in the end. So I don't think that if there's already clarity uh, about this, because how will you assess if a model is fair or if you just copyright data or, you know, how, how will you do that? It's, it's something that technically it's, most of the times it's really hard to do. So probably we'll end up with some kind of, you know, um, certification in terms of the processes that are using, uh, that are being followed by, by the companies. And, um, yeah, and Paul, but, but I, I don't have a, a, a definitive answer. I don't know if anyone else on, on that, how that's going to be controlled. We know that, uh, the, 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 the amount of money you have to pay when you infringe is very high, like 7% <laughs> of the, so, so I think that's going to scare people probably. Uh, well, you know, it's like, it's better not to infringe what's written here, but in the end, the assessment itself, I don't know what kind of experts can then, uh, do that type of assessment. Technically, the, so, but, but yeah, but as, uh, as Katrina was saying, I think just by following certain processes and so on, I think the, the, the impact is going to be positive and uh, we'll get better AI, more responsible AI. That's the, what we want to achieve. Well, uh, another question? No? No more questions. Oh, we still have questions. We still have time. I, I know it's, it's a long session, but... Well, uh, <clears throat> my name is, is Carlos, and I am from uh, Isaac, not very far from here. Um, and um, well, uh, I have not not just questions, but <laughs> comments also. Uh, well, I think that probably uh, I don't know if you agree, but something like an auditing process, it is more than certification. An auditing process is something that makes sense. Uh, for me, I don't know if you if you agree or not. Um, in what extent um, you say that uh, people are afraid of AI, and I think that this is good. <laughs> I think that what it is bad, it is when they are not afraid, where they they are not uh, uh, aware of, uh, of 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 what 
what is happening uh, and what it is the, the impact in the, their jobs and so on. So, so this is what uh, I, I attend um, uh, um, a business, uh, uh, an event in, in New York in a business school of the Baroque uh, College, and there were several uh, people from from companies and from academy, academia, and what they told it is exactly this. Being afraid, it is a, a first step, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, it is. And, and I, it, at least it, it is my my perspective. I don't know if you if you agree or or not. Um, and uh, well, this is also another comment that is not related <laughs> at all with the AA. AA. It, it is more about the the centrality of Lisbon and other other cities. And I think that problem it is that even Lisbon it is not decentralized. I'm in Iseg and uh, for me uh, going to FCT or to or to the parliament that are to power uh, 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 institutions next to my organization it is a good uh, a very large step <laughs> so i think that sometimes the problem it is but i i agree that there is a need of decentralized obviously ge geography it is it is an important uh, uh, barrier but i think that we have here a, a problem of uh, um, power distance in our society and this is also another another problem. So, <laughs> this is something. Just comments. Yeah, it's just it's just just some comments. Obviously, uh, do you want to comment anything <laughs> back? Comment Maybe on. the FCT. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to so, change. Uh, well, <laughs> on FCT, I can uh, simply say that I'm constantly uh, in Zoom meetings with every <laughs> every university uh, who needs something. Uh, Francisco, you have five minutes. That's, <laughs> that's my day. And of course, I always switch uh, Zoom and I speak with everyone respective, irrespectively if it is in Coimbra. Or, and the, I'm also in tour with Leitão and so forth. <laughs> <laughs> so it's part of my... my uh, yeah, but, and it's really delightful, uh, for instance, to discover uh, how is the, the building of the rector in Coimbra and so forth. I'm not used to this type of charms and, and, and your nice, university nice. is magic. So it's great to be to try to be as close as possible and uh, it's pretty easier. It's much easier to do that yeah. uh, these days than in the past. Yeah. Krisa also had an opinion. On, on the people being afraid of AI, I think it can lead to something useful if they're afraid but interested to attend, for example, mm -hmm. a workshop that will allow them to learn more and will help them to know how to use it, to know what to expect more than how to use it, I think. Uh, but I think there is also another side in that that leads more to the type of fear that makes you just reject it. Um, and I would say that can be just as bad as being overly excited and thinking that it solved all your problems and yeah. you're never going to need anything else than ChatGPT ever again. So I think, and the solution to that probably is democratization and trying to educate people as much as possible. And keep in mind that we need probably to approach it a bit differently than we approach teaching PhD students or teaching university students um, in a class. So it's a different level mm -hmm. uh, of communication, which I find really interesting in general with science. I think it's science is nice when we can so to everyone why it's useful and mm -hmm. why it's beneficial so all these events i think there's also kind of science that was organized uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, regarding the geographic uh, i think that uh, uh, zoom and all related <laughs> were a big uh, improvement in reducing those distances but after some point, you don't make things happen by Zoom. <laughs> yeah. If you don't meet, yeah. it's like here, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't meet, if you don't go places, if you don't, if you are not with the persons, things don't happen. And I think even companies are starting to feel that, asking employees to come 
especially new employees. So that that so it's <laughs> regarding the the fear of AI. I I, comp I think Krisa was completely on spot. That session was an eye opener to me. Everyone was almost physically afraid <laughs> because they were there was a programmer there that said something that before took me a week to do I do now in two hours what will I do in six months how will I live in six months what will be my way of living yeah. Yeah. so that was the kind of uh, feedback we got from from artists that said, well, but before I did something and people paid for my work, now they go there and they have something that it's not as good, but people think it's enough and it's not fair because copyright laws are not applicable to these models and they should be. Okay. Someone said, there's no ChatGPT in Africa, so it's not fair. <laughs> Inequalities will, will be sky high. So, those sometimes misconceptions, sometimes not so misconceptions, are everywhere. So things like these are really important, and I think literacy is is the key. Yeah, just just about the the fear uh, part. I think there are two fears here. When there's the that kind of uh, stupid fear about the uh, extinction of the species. <laughs> that is, I think. No, we all agree that doesn't make any sense. And then there's the, the, the fear that uh, we we're talking about, about losing our jobs, you know, being replaced by AI and, and, and so on. And I think that happens, you know, uh, all the time when there's a big transformation. And so this, this really shows the impact of this technology. But we, what we have seen historically is that, you know, the human species always, uh, you know, uh, makes progress in terms of, uh, you know, well-being and, and so on. And uh, some, uh, jobs uh, will probably be replaced by AI, like uh, telemarketing, for example. Uh, but most of the jobs, I think, will be the ones that have to deal with language, you know, to kind of knowledge work, uh, will be augmented by AI, will be complemented by AI. Also, um, uh, jobs that have to do with creativity, I think we'll reach a point where everyone is going to be able to produce amazing illustrations to do amazing slides but then you'll always have the artists the real creative minds that will make the difference that will really change you now uh, using these tools will you know will uh, be the the ones that you will want to work for to you know uh, distinguish what what you are doing so that's i think the the, the mindset the right mindset is about thinking about uh, complementarity uh, of um, of the jobs um, and, to, and and not about uh, of course but but some the ones that have to deal with repetitive tasks i think those will disappear but that's that's okay i think it's it's part of uh, the evolution of the species yeah. but i think we don't need to be afraid of uh, you know creative jobs because they will always exist you know they, and, and yeah. even <laughs> further even further yeah. so i would ask for one last question i think there was one there this is more of a um, of an, an obtuse question, perhaps an abstract one, um, but I'd like to hear what the panel thinks about the um, the experience of contemporary society seems to be um, a um, a synchronized kind of ex um, revelation of the human being more uh, decoded and seen as a machine, and the machines sort of becoming more human um, and so both our humanity and our and our machine like um, uh, our, I was going to say nature but it's not nature like the sort of mechanical sides of us are being accentuated and um, and it's I, I find it interesting uh, there's an interesting dilemma then proposed because y you often use the analogy of the brain to describe how circuitry works or how machines work but at a certain point that analogy is no longer going to be relevant because the machine is going to is going to be um is going to develop past the brain because the 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 the, the tempo of its evolution is 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 um is such um i've just if if anybody's <laughs> considering this or if you could recommend um writers or or thinkers that are, are thinking about sort of the 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 um Material neurobiology biolo versus the synthetic. Thanks. Do you have any 
any recommendation, any idea? Thank you. Um, I think most people, um, what most people think about that is, so we call it singularity, where, where you'll have a, a general AI, that's an AI that can do everything a human does as good or as, as well as a human does. And everyone in the community says we are really, really far from it. So that tempo that you mentioned uh, is probably exacerbating what language models are. So there is a, um, it's called talking parrots, right? Mm -hmm. The, the, a stochastic, paper, stochastic, stochastic parrots. parrots. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that, well, the gist of the paper is that Language models are like parrots, they just repeat what they have heard before. So it's a simplistic version of the paper, so you can go through it. It's a really good paper. Uh, it has a bias, but uh, I would say that it, that bias is followed for, for, uh, from a lot of the community, that we are really far away from singularity. So uh, if we ever reach singularity, a really big doubt, a question mark that people point is on creativity and empathy that would be really hard to mimic. Okay. So, and another thing, I, I think you may have a point there, but just to say that, um, I, I was saying that uh, we are far away from singularity and they, they don't have that, uh, the, the area of creativity and empathy. Maybe we are being less sympathetic. And one thing that I, I, I know I was going to is about emotions. Uh, actually, there is a, a nice group of researchers in Greenberg that works in emotion recognition. And um, you have the emotions, you know that something has. You have the ones you, you know you should feel or you think you should feel. And then you have the ones that you feel. So you, you may know that the movie is an horror movie, so it will be, there will be fear there. You, you can look at a thing and say, I'm, I have fear of that, or you can have a goosebump and have real fear. So those three levels, I think it's because a machine may think or may be under the impression of feeling an emotion, but on that part, it, it, the singularity, I think it's, Without the physical mm. part, we will not reach. So, I, I think uh, the stochastic parrots is a good paper to start because it shows how limited these extraordinary models are yet. Um, I, I think you touched upon very different aspects overall. I will mention two things that came to my mind. Um, one, I don't remember, I was trying to recall as Katerina was speaking, there was... Um, uh, a psychiatrist uh, that was proposing that when we are interacting with ChatGPT, we need to demonstrate empathy. Uh, not because we need to train the model in empathy, but because we must not uh, let go of our own. So I found it fascinating, and it was <coughs> the very early months of ChatGPT, so I think around December or January of last year, so only a couple of months in. And I found it very interesting and as a person that is using it every day, multiple times per day, and we have people here that they're working with me, I always uh, do you say please when you're putting your prompts? Because then the next time that you will text me, you will forget because you're using the same chat to say please and thank you at the end uh, for the positive reinforcement that also humans need. And the other thing that came to me, and uh, it's... And it's not self-promotion for the activities of the center, but in the annual forum uh, of, uh, of the center, we had the immense privilege uh, to have Antonio Damasio with us. <laughs> and it ended up uh, with him explaining in one of the most brilliant things that I've witnessed live. And it is available uh, to watch the video. And that's why I'm bringing it up. Uh, what is consciousness? and how consciousness is understood, and how much link this to emotions. And then he finished, again, with something that is quite close to, to, to your point, uh, a debate about the physical limits, the human consciousness versus a, a possible hypothetical um, virtual conscious uh, coming from the machine. So that might be a very interesting thing to watch. Yeah. 
Uh, so yeah. there's the, yeah, I, and, I, I, go go. And now, now you touch the topic of yes, consciousness. consciousness. <laughs> you open the the Pandora. Uh, box. You open the Pandora box. Yes, yeah. So we have. Uh, if you are interested in 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 following uh, this topic of feelings, empathy, and and so on, so um, we be challenged the uh, a neuroscientist Antonio Damasio and uh, a computational uh, scientist, uh, Erlinda Oliveira, to, to have a conversation about the future of AI and that touch, touch a lot of topics that have to do with, with consciousness, if machines will ever be conscious, because to reach the kind of uh, singularity, uh, you will need to, to, to get that point. Uh, so machines will need to, to have some kind of agency, then they will need to to be able to take you know decisions by themselves uh, and uh, and that's very much related with the emotions so the Masio has been written, writing about feelings and emotions for many years so he was the first neuroscientist that put emotions uh, you know uh, front stage uh, so at the time it's funny but in 90 something 95 when he published the cards error uh, so uh, emotions were uh, looked uh, as something of a weakness of the human being. Uh, and so it was not uh, being taken serious. And what he proposed at the time was that emotions were like really very important for decision making. So we, you know, and after that, you know, a big trend. And so that connects with feelings and, and that. Uh, and so for a machine to be conscious, according to, to his theory, the, the machine will need to have some kind of feelings and then feelings is related with life. Uh, so you have to have kind of uh, homeostatic feelings. You have some kind of uh, to have to be vulnerable. And so uh, when we enter this discussion about vulnerability, um, uh, then uh, we end up in something that probably doesn't make sense. Why would uh, human uh, beings create machines that are vulnerable, that can die? Okay, so it's like, uh, okay, could be on the on the road to singularity or whatever and to reach but you know did, did you know that a robot can't even open many doors you know a robot cannot put the dishes so i was listening to a talk the other day <laughs> and to, uh you know uh, one of the biggest challenges uh, in the world of robotics and francisco knows, knows about that he's part of a research group on, on this area is uh, to put the dishes in a washing machine, and that's you no know, scientists think that this task will take you no know, many many years to accomplish, and so we are very far from 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 solving manipulation problems that uh, you know, uh, and so what what you know it do not make the sense to to do something that is vulnerable you know that that has kind of a, a body you know because this this always touches the, the the point of the body for it to be vulnerable you have to have a body why would you want to have a body for ChatGPT doesn't make sense. But if you are interested in this topic, so uh, we challenge the uh, Antonio to, you know, uh, to continue to publish on this area. As he himself said uh, on, on November 25th, the definition of consciousness uh, is only uh, valid at the moment, you know, you, you talk about it. <laughs> it evolves yeah. over time. Uh, but um, so we, we, we're going to publish the... Um, the, the, the video of the lecture, it's already online on the, the Espresso newspaper, but we're going to publish the, um, the, the video uh, and then the, the debate that happened afterwards, which is very, it was very, you know, uh, engaging and yeah. surprising. <laughs> and, to, and then we're going to start a series of letters on consciousness and AI. And we're going to have the spring letter uh, that's going to come out. So the, my challenge to the team was to release all this by spring. So... March 21st, just ping us and we will do that for you. So just so that we have something online on, on this topic. Uh, so, and I will not go into the human empathy part because that's a much bigger discussion. <laughs> well, you can also discuss now uh, with food. First of all, I would like to ask for an applause for this panel. Thank you very much for, for accepting my invitation. Sorry for the long, really long talk. I hope it was enjoyable. And thank you very much for coming. And see you in our next events. Thank you so much to our speakers, Francisco, Paulo, Chrissa, Catarina and Jacovina, to our audience and to our partners, Pierre de Almeida and Zendesk. If you like this content, please share it with everyone you think would like it as well. And subscribe to our meetup group 
where we share all our events. Follow us on social media, Instagram, X, LinkedIn, YouTube, and even TikTok. You can find all of these in our website, deeplearning.pt. If you have a special topic of interest, maybe you can find people that share that interest on our Discord server. We have a commitment with diversity and decentralization. So if you have suggestions on how to accomplish that, please let us know. Suggest speakers, suggest venues, suggest other kinds of events. We are listening. Our intro music was done with Refusion, the old version, and the episode was edited by me. And lastly, thank you very much for listening, and we see you in our next episode.